important chain, which is the toric 228. These chains are made of many elements. I don't go into the details, but if you want, we could. But you have a subsequent case of alpha, beta, gamma of different kinds. All down lead. Lead 206 or lead 208, which are the stable elements. All elements heavier than lead are radioactive. Okay? And uh, all isotopes of very heavy elements are not stable. So, uh, in nature, you have uranium 238, which is about 5 billion years lifetime. So, there is still plenty of uranium 238 because the Earth is less old than 5 billion years. Well, it's, it's about 5 billion years, so it's about one uranium lifetime, but uranium is still around. And the same can be said for uranium. That's why we have these radioactive chains in nature, because we have these two isotopes that are unstable, as all very heavy nuclei, but they have a very long life and compared to the Earth age. So it's a purely astronomical reason why we have, why we have this uranium and thorium around. And this is extremely important because uranium and thorium chains dominate Together with potassium 40, which is another long lived isotope that is still the remaining of the supernova, of the set of supernovas that exploded around this area and from which the solar system generated five billion years ago. So, even potassium 40 is an unstable element, about two point something billion years. But two point something billion years is still a long, long age, about half of the Earth age, so there is still a lot of potassium for So when you ask yourself where natural radioactivity comes from, essentially it comes from these two, three things, uranium, thorium, and potassium. Now, now not exactly, there are others, but these others are less important. So uranium and thorium background is like that. And that's why when I told you radioactivity ends at 2.615, this was an almost exact statement. It doesn't end completely, but there is a big drop. There is a big, this is a long scale, okay? So you go down by essentially two orders of magnitude when you move from the 2.5 down to 2.7. Okay. At 2.7 there is a big drop and the drop continues. These very high energy are mostly alphas, which made them easier to fight because an alpha particle is very weakly penetrating. It's very just a sheet of paper is sufficient to stop alpha particles. So it's relatively easy to shield your detector from alpha radioactivity, you still have to be careful on internal alpha radioactivity or on the surface contamination of the crystals or of the detectors. But this is less dangerous than the gammas, which you have to shield very well, and you need several centimeters or sometimes tens of centimeters of lead to shield effectively the gammas. But that is the spectrum. And in that plot, uh, you see where the candidates are. And as you can see, the theory of conservation of travel applies also in this case. Because the best nuclear, from the point of technological point of view, are the worst from the point of view of the bank. Because certainly, technologically, germanium, <coughs> xenon, and tellurium are the most interesting. interesting. Cadmium, selenium, and molybdenum are less easy to use technologically, either because it's not easy to enrich or because they are extremely poisoning like cadmium, cadmium, so it's not easy to manipulate. Molybdenum 100 is not easy to get. Selenium 82 
it's very difficult to make crystals out of selenium. So there are various problems that make the technology of molybdenum, molybdenum selenium, and cadmium less attractive than the lurium, xenon, and germanium. But as you can see, the backup we have in the tellurium, xenon, and germanium region is higher. Tellurium is the best one from the point of view. In, among these three, tellurium is anyway in a better shape compared to the typical macro. But again, conservation of trouble, energy resolution of germanium detector is better. So finally, the effectiveness per kilogram of detector of germanium and tellurium, I would say it's quite similar. If you have a 100 kilogram germanium detector, you have a sensitivity that can be even better than a high 100 kilogram tellurium detector because the energy resolution you can obtain with germanium is better. But germanium is more expensive, so it's easier to make one ton of tellurium than one ton of germanium. Then one ton of germanium is a huge cost. One ton of tellurium is feasible. One ton of xenon is even easier because xenon is quite easy to get and purify. But it's not. But you cannot make a crystal with xenon, and so the energy resolution, as we will, as we will see, is worse because technically the use for xenon is not as good as the one you use for germanium and germanium. So. Um, As you can see, um, again I insist on this conservation of trouble because it, it's true. I mean, it's, it's a very unfortunate coincidence, but it's true. Because uh, the end of radioactivity, essentially, not only of natural radioactivity, but also of the radon 222 decay. Radon 222 is emitted in the uranium chain. There is a lot of radon around because it's a gas, it's a noble gas, it's diffused everywhere. It's in the air, especially if you don't keep your window open, you accumulate radon even in your house. And uh, this radon has uh, induced radioactivity up to 3.2 MeV. So calcium would be absolutely beautiful because it's completely out of radioactivity region, but calcium, as I told you, is super difficult to handle because it's very rare and very difficult to do a bridge. Zirconium and neodymium. Neodymium, there is no way to enrich, and also the zirconium is not easy to enrich, and they are rare elements, quite expensive, and the best one. So, currently, the technological problem has made the Germanium, tellurium, and xenon the most attractive, even if that they are not really the best from the point of view of the background. They are in the region where natural radioactivity is relevant. But the technology are much better, and this generation of experiment are using, is using these three isotopes. Probably next generation of experiment will try to move at least to molybdenum, which is a reasonable candidate, or maybe selenium. Cadmium has the problem of this uh, extremely poisoning element. You get cancer if you want to remove cadmium. So it's not easy to get because if you want to buy cadmium crystals, they are enormously expensive because the workers that have to do it have to do it uh, uh, with a lot of care. It's like beryllium. Beryllium is very useful but also very expensive because it's extremely difficult to manipulate it because you easily get cancer if you work with beryllium without uh, necessary care. Um, this we already discussed, the calculation of the matrix area. You have a good sense of disagreement between different techniques. Uh, it's 
quite evident that we have a problem, but it's not clear what is the solution of this problem. The fact that we have a problem is clear because if we have uh, predictions with very small errors in substantial and uh, unavoidable disagreement. Uh, and also there is a systematic because uh, Shell model, which is uh, the black curve, and uh, is uh, systematically lower than other techniques. Uh, some theoretician uh, believes in the quasi random phase approximation, QRPA, which is the green, but also that disagrees uh, very strongly often. So the situation is confused. There is no real uh, agreement between the theoretician on what should be the right way to do this calculation and how reliable this calculation could be. So, experimental sensitivity. You want to measure the mass of the neutrino. Measure the mass of the neutrino, you need to try to understand what parameters you have to control. And uh, if your detector has a background, because if, there is, if the background is zero, this formula does not apply, of course. The sensitivity does not go zero, does not go to zero if the background is zero, of course. But if you have no zero background, the sensitivity to the neutrino mass. Uh, goes this way, and uh, first of all, notice the 1 to the 4th, so it's a square, 4th square of that, which means that you, if you want to gain sensitivity, it's a factor of 10, you need to improve this by a factor of 1,000, okay, so another doing, I mean, if you, if you aim at another generation of experiment, and you want a sensitivity that is 10 times better than the existing one, you have to work on B, delta E, M, and T at the level of 10 to the 4. Uh, then you depend on Q, which is the end point. So Q depends on the nucleus you choose, M depends on the nucleus you choose. So the first factor is fixed once you have chosen a nucleus. Then of course you have B, the background. You want to keep the background as low as possible. You have an energy resolution. This is very crucial. Of course the energy resolution is important because when you have the energy resolution, the width of your peak depends on the resolution. Okay? So it's clear that if you have a better delta E, you collect all the signal but you reduce the background linearly. If, you have, if your resolution is a factor of one half smaller, it means that you have the same signal and half better. So it's quite obvious that delta E and B are both linear the same way. Then you have M, which is the mass, the active mass, so the mass of isotope that decays. On T, you can do little because uh, this generation of experiment are designed to work between 5 and 10 years, and of course, you cannot increase that by any large factor. 10 years of data taking is a maximum that we can reasonably expect. So, T you cannot change, but you can work on the background, on the energy resolution, and on the mass. You want to, to have a very large mass with very low background and very good energy resolution. These are the three key points to design and it's been a stable data decay experiment. Current generation of experiment are between the 10 kilogram scale up to the 200 kilogram scale, which is the mass of quorum, 
and the one ton scale that is foreseen for Snow Plus and the 200 kilograms that is used in EXO, 200 kilograms that is, or half a ton that is used in Canva and Zen. I'm making just some, some examples, but the scale is between a few tens of kilograms up to one ton foreseen in the next with very different energy resolution, so it doesn't, doesn't imply that the bigger is better because, for example, Kanban Zen has the largest mass but has much higher background and much worse energy resolution, so it's not the best aspect. And also, they use a different nuclei, so the comparison is not straightforward because when you have to compare the sensitivity, you must know the nuclear magnetic which you, you don't know. So the comparison between experiments of different nuclei is not straightforward. This is a, what I already said, the scale of existing experiments. Uh, these are the regions allowed for neutrino mass as a function of the lowest energy neutrino in case of direct or inverse hierarchy. If it is direct, the allowed region is the green, so the neutrino mass of double beta decay can be between 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the minus 2. While if you have inverse hierarchy, you go from 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 1. It makes a whole world of difference. If nature has chosen direct hierarchy, no way. We, we are out of business. There is no plan experiment that can go there. Because as you can see, the 10 to 200 kilogram scale, which is the one we have now, is uh, attacking the inverse hierarchy region, but not completely. Next generation of experiments planned or dreamed or designed will go down because uh, if you have a ton scale, a few ton scale, and you have this background, 10 to the minus 3 counts per kilogram per care per year, per ton, sorry. This is extremely challenging. Take into account that current generation experiment, like a quarry, for example, quarry is designed to have a background of the order of 10 counts per ton per year. And uh, you have to do a factor at least 100 better, maybe 1000 better. And you have to increase the mass by a factor 10 in order to attack the inverse hierarchy region. So it's, it will be super challenge. But there is no gain in changing only the mass, okay? Multiplying the mass by 2, by 3, by 4, by 10 changes very little because of that 4. You have to multiply all factor by 10 if you want to gain. So you have to increase the mass, but you also have to invent new techniques, new technologies, new methods either to purify the material or to reject the background or most probably both because if you want to achieve that you need very low background, intrinsic very low background so very pure detectors and at the same time the detector should have the capability to separate the neutrino that is double beta decay candidates from natural radioactivity candidates, at least uh, some of them. Otherwise, uh, just by purification, I suspect it's going to be too easy, too difficult, and just by a background rejection, it's still too difficult. You need both. You need very low background, very good resolution, very good rejection power to attack the inverse here. Enrichment is one issue. Enrichment is one issue. Uh, as I told you, as 
conservation, conservation of trouble. Uh, neodymium, zirconium, and calcium are extremely good uh, from the point of view of the Q value, but they cannot be centrifugated. The typical mean, the typical way to make isotope separation is by centrifuges. Okay? But in order to be able to use a centrifuge, you need to make the element in gas form. Not all elements allow themselves to be put in gas in a reasonable way. Particularly, there is no known technical mean to make a gas out of calcium, zirconium, or neodymium that can be used in a centrifuge. So the only option is through laser separations or diffusions, but these methods cannot be scaled. You can do very efficient laser separation, but with milligrams of material, maybe grams of material, but you cannot do tons. Centrifugation is relatively available for the others, so you can do it. But of course, the cost depends on the element. If you have already a the blue one is, is xenon. Xenon is already a gas, so you can centrifugate xenon by itself. You need not. While the others, you need to make some compound that is gaseous at room temperature. It's not poisoning, it's not dangerous, it's not corrosive, and all that limit your possibilities. For example, you can make easily. Some gas using chlorine, okay, azafluoruro or azafluoruro. But that is extremely dangerous to handle and uh, makes everything extremely expensive. Anyway, this is the status of enrichment. What you can enrich easily is xenon. What you can enrich the, not easily but feasible is tellurium, molybdenum. Germanium and selenium. You cannot enrich at this point in time. There is no technology available for calcium, for zinc, or for neodymium. There are many R&D projects, but no, no solution. All experiments should see two neutrino decay. Two neutrino decay has been observed for many nuclei. Some of them in a very neat and precise way, some of them with rough errors. Some measurements are geochemicals. What does it mean, geochemical? It means uh, that uh, you don't make an experiment to let the nucleus decay and observe it and count, but you just go into a rock and search for a daughter. If the daughter, you have some reason to believe that the daughter cannot exist in nature because its life is sufficiently short. Long enough to be seen in the little rock, but short compared to the Earth's lifetime. For example, the decay of uranium 238, if I remember well, is done geochemically. And also tellurium 128 and also zirconium 96. Uh, what does it mean? It means that the double dedan decay daughter can be found in the rock, and the, the lifetime of this daughter is, for example, one million year. If the lifetime of the daughter is one million year, it means that you can accumulate statistics for one million year. But if you find it, you cannot say it was there from the origin, because one million is anyway too, too short for the lifetime of the Earth. So if you observe the two neutrino decay of two, uranium-238 as a daughter, cannot be something that was already there, it must be something that become, comes from the decay of uranium-238. So this is the geochemical 
it's not very interesting from our point of view because you cannot learn much. You cannot measure very easily. The errors are very big, as you can see, because you are limited by the technique. You barely have a clear evidence of the It's less than the single measure. But, but it's a technique. For other nuclei, like for example xenon, the measurement was done uh, directly, and uh, as you can see, you had a 10% measurement of the lifetime uh, that came from uh, Camelot and the EXO experiments. Germanium was measured by Gerda, and Tellurium was measured by Koichino, and also by Neymar. Techniques. You have two large classes of techniques. One is the tracking calorimeters, the trackers, in which you have a detector that is capable to measure the tracks of the two electrons, the constructing them completely, possibly the magnetic field, so you measure the momentum you reconstruct the energy of the two electrons. And you prove that you have two electrons coming from the same vertex and with the same charge. So you have truly two electrons originating from a single point. So this is clearly the feature of the tracker. The other option is to have a calorimeter in which the event is inside something that absorbs completely the two electrons and release energy. The advantage of the first technique is that it's very neat and the background can be very low, possibly close to zero, because if you, have, if you reconstruct very well the two tracks and you reconstruct very well the momentum, the background of these experiments can be very, very low. But usually you cannot put a very large mass, because if you put a lot of mass, then the multiple scattering and the self-absorption and the unwanted effect on the electrons will decrease very rapidly the energy resolution and the, and the advantage will disappear. So you can have a very neat measurement but it's very difficult to have a ton scale experiment of that kind. Although there are some ideas to do that. The calorimeters on the other side allow large masses, but in this case you just measure the energy and so you do need to have a very good energy resolution to fight the background. So, uh, I will not cover all possible detectors, of course. I will cover some. Nemo Supernemo are a good example of tracking calorimeters. And the next and EXO. EXO, but even more next, are options for TPCs with Xenon inside. Xenon is the only one that possibly will allow very large mass in a TPC. That's what I said before, there is one exception. Because Xenon is a gas. So you can fill the TPC with Xenon, and if you are making if you are able to make the TPC work with Xenon, you can obtain the tracking capability, the advantage of the tracking capability, but also possibly a very large mass. I like a lot Next. Next is an idea for the future. Maybe, not, I don't know if we can cover it this but I want to cover it like next one, next uh, time, next uh, lecture, because it's potentially very interesting. Current generation of calorimeters are Gerda and Majorana with the Germanic diodes. Gerda is running, Majorana is a long term experiment in the future. Quoe is the running experiment of Gran Sasso with its prototype that is called Quoe Zero. And 
quarter will run probably late next year with the barometers of the moon. There are also other experiments like Lucifer with the zinc component date that are also calorimetric experiments like Exxon. Exxon is a hybrid between a calorimeter and the tracking PPC because it's a liquid tracking PPC. The two electrons are reconstructed but with less precision than with gas PPC. And then there are liquid xenon or xenon dissolved in liquid scintillator. There are many potential ideas like a compound, snow glass, and other options in Korea, called Amore, and uh, but these are RMDs and I'm not going to call them. This to give you a sense of the lot of activity that I have it's around the Nemo 3 is a, a tracking calorimeter in which you have a drift chambers, modules of drift chambers made with sizes. Uh, you have a magnetic field so you can bend the tracks and measure the momentum. You have plastic scintillators and, uh, that are used as an uh, absorption calorimeter in the sense that the electrons move into the gas and then uh, are collected by calorimeters that are at the borders of these chambers. And this means that you have a full reconstruction of the event because you can reconstruct the two electrons, you can prove that it's a two electron pair coming from the same point, you can reconstruct the invariant mass which you, from which you may get the proof, the energy of the decay. And these detectors are absolutely the best for two neutrino. For two neutrino they are unbeatable because the background is very low and the resolution is not bad. In this case, uh, your problem is the resolution because uh, you have the 2 neutrino and the zero neutrino. This is a good example of molybdenum 100. The blue is the contribution to the 2 neutrino decay. Then there is a little bit of background which is the green, which is uh, radon and then uh, you have uh, the potential signal due to internal background which is uh, mimic in the neutrino established decay region but of course in this plot it's clear that there is no evidence of the neutrino established decay but you can see how clean is the technique because the events are neatly reconstructed and uh, it's not by chance uh, that uh, the, these detectors have given the most precise measurement of the two neutrino. They have different modules and in the different modules they put different isotopes so they can uh, provide uh, measurement for their very different isotopes. They measured three, seven isotopes. They measured with the lifetime in two neutrino and they have put limits on the zero neutrino. They are not very competitive on the zero neutrino because this experiment never could install very large masses. They use uh, 
relatively small amount of uh, mass because they have no way to install it. But there is a program that is called the Super Demo, in which uh, you just uh, make it big. So the idea is to replicate Demo and uh, to go to the 100 kilogram scale just by brute force brute force by duplicating several modules. Uh, the point is that uh, this will make uh, a very expensive and very difficult detector to build and operate. This program is not funded completely yet. They are building the prototype but there is no real clear plan for the, the whole thing. <coughs> it should be in Modan, they should be the extension of the laboratoires of the Modan and SN, but they never did so far the excavation of this extension, so they have no place to put this detector. So this is in principle a nice program, but I'm not sure it's going to happen or when it's going to happen. Another very interesting technique is the one of germanium detectors. In this case, you use a very well known and proven and understood technique, which is the technique of germanium diodes. Of course, they are very peculiar diodes because, as you can see, they are super big, like that. They are cans of uh, germanium. In this case, uh, they have used uh, enriched germanium crystals. Enriched germanium crystals in which the signal, due to clever electronics without, allowed to separate the surface event from the bulk events and also a little bit to separate the multi-site which means the events generated by one gamma which makes the several quantum scattering so the energy deposit is in that different location from the alpha and beta. The defect, the, the problem of this uh, approach is that the germanium is super expensive and scaling to very large masses is not obvious. But there is a problem, very ambitious for a 300 million detector, which is called Majorana, and which would be one ton of germanium crystals, like that. One experiment about 10 years ago has made a claim of neutrino less double beta decay with germanium detector which is now well known as a Klaptor claim because the person who made it is called Klaptor Klein, Rothaus but Klaptor for friends he has no friends but everybody called him for Klaptor <laughs> but anyway uh, he is retired, you know, he's an old man and uh, right before his retirement they published this paper, which was not signed by 90% of the collaboration, was, was, was signed just by a small group mm -hmm. of the collaboration, in which they claim that what they call the line, which is uh, that stuff, the regression marks, is signal of the double decay. This paper exists. It's not yet completely ruled out by, not, by other experiments. It's very, very now in, in jeopardy, in the sense that the existing limits are close to kill it completely, but it's not true that they kill it completely. It's still somewhat alive, but I suspect it will disappear in the next gathering experiment. But so far, it's an option. Uh, even in ignoring the existing limit 
from other experiments, and of course you can see by eye that this evidence is not very convincing. Uh, there are lines, and there is a line, this could be a line, in the right place, but the weak point of all this is that they have another line here that they don't know what it is, possibly another line here that they don't know what it is. So they have, a, actually this is the tau beta decay value, and this is two lines that they don't know what they are. They know these three lines, but they, don't do, they do not explain these two, and then they claim this is a, Clearly they have a line, but this makes me, um, it gives me the opportunity to make a comment that is very important. Discovery of the neutrinoless double beta decay must be done by at least two experiments in two different This is well understood by the community, and the reason is very simple. Because if you see a line, if you see a line in the right place, you can't be sure it's double beta decay. It could be an unknown line from some kind of nuclear, very rare nuclear decay of something. You have no way, you have only TPC detector do not have this problem. If uh, the neutrinoless double beta decay would be found by an experiment that fully reconstructs the final state with the two electrons, with sufficient precision to separate the zero neutrino from the two neutrino, then probably that claim would be enough. But if a calorimetric experiment discovered neutrinoless double beta decay, I believe that, of course, there would be a lot of excitement if one experiment gave us clear and ambiguous signal, but I suspect that the guy would not go to Stockholm immediately, but he would need a second experiment to observe the neutrinoless double beta decay with another nuclei because of this problem, because you cannot intrinsically be 100% sure that you are observing the neutrinoless double beta decay. Intrinsically, because of course within your, within your resolution it's not impossible that two lines are so close that they cannot be disentangled. By the way, the supposedly double beta decay is not exactly matching the Q-body. Okay. The error is, is consistent, it's within the error you could accept it, but could well be that this is a gamma line close to the two body, but not double beta. Actually, everybody believes that that's a gamma line close to the two body, but this is an opinion, and it's an opinion that does not matter. You can look at that flow to make your own, uh, make your own idea. But regardless of the plot, be careful that if this is double beta, it corresponds to a very large neutrino mass, and that mass range, as I told you, is not totally excluded. It's not five sigma excluded, but it's it's something like two point nine sigma excluded from at least two other experiments. So nobody believes it. It's not impossible, but Likely, what they have in that plot is some kind of not understood vector. Gerta is the evolution of this experiment. This was called the Heidelberg Moscow Germanium Experiment. Gerta is uh, the follow up of this. Uh, the Moscow experiment in which the experiment was uh, done again mm -hmm. with much better shielding from the background. In this case, uh, you learn about the concept that we will uh, repeatedly see in these techniques. You go on the ground first, 
Then you build the tank of water, and you fill it with water. Then you put another tank into the water. And in this case, it's another tank filled with liquid iron. And then you put, you drop your germanium crystals into your liquid iron. The iron gives you the cryogenic, because of course you are talking about cold liquid iron. The iron is better than nitrogen for cooling because it's higher Z. And so it provides you with a better shielding from external radiation. Unfortunately, I believe it's a mistake, or at least uh, they found a lot of troubles, because argon has uh, two radioactive isotopes. One is argon-39, and the other one is argon-42. And actually, the gas experiment had a lot of troubles because of these two radioactive argon isotopes. They maintain that argon is the right choice, but I disagree. I think they should have used nitrogen, but they preferred to, to improve the shielding from external radiation, paying the price of internal radioactivity. I would have done the opposite, but it's quite different. Well, I would have done, but just to understand it, that you have to, to make sometimes difficult choices. Because, uh, of course, uh, your your liquid should be as high C as possible to improve your shielding. Actually, there is one solution, very easy, which would be xenon. That would be perfect because it's even heavier than argon and has no radioactive isotopes. But unfortunately, xenon is a super expensive. So they did not go to the on budget. Don't make, mix up what we said for dark matter that here, I mean, here argon is only the role of uh, shielding, okay? It's a liquid, it's a cold liquid. It doesn't play any role in the experiment except being a good shield against external radiation because you can purify the argon very well except that you cannot purify atom from atom itself, that's the point. So if you have a radioactive isotope, you have to be careful. And, uh, but the experiment worked. They could find ways to fight this argon-42 argon-42 But the problem is the argon-42 or 39? 42 in the case of that matter. I don't go into many details, but it's not even the argon 42 by itself. The argon 42 go encased into potassium 42, and it's the potassium 42 that has a gamma line that is dangerous for the for the of the It's the spectrum of argon and uh, fusion and This is the argon 39. The 42, 42 is a little higher, but anyway, it's well below what they did not uh, understood when they designed it. They had a lot of trouble. Then they, they, they saved themselves, but that's why I said I would not have saved it, because they have been very lucky. Because they took this huge risk of, of accepting the, the radioactive isotope into the liquid. They said, okay, but argon and uh, and uh, 39 and argon 32, uh, 42 are no energy, so we don't care. But, and potassium 42, okay, they made some simulation and they had no problems. Unfortunately, they forgot one thing. Of course, the second boy is always easy, so uh, I'm talking now after the solution, but. Uh, the problem they found is that the potassium 42 you produce uh, through radioactivity is ionized. You are in a liquid that is super pure, so the ion remains an ion. You have an electric field that is the one that polarized the germanium. So this electric field was sucking 
the potassium. So it's, their, their simulation were completely wrong because they were assuming the potassium all over the volume. Instead, the potassium was drifted toward the detector by the electric field. So they found a lot of a much higher potassium for the super than they expected. It took them some time, but then they finally understood that the effect was this one. And the problem was, was solved by adding grids to avoid the electric field of the germanium to go into, into the liquid. And they actually made the opposite. They put grids to have a, a field that was moving the potassium. So they had some other, some other electric field inside the Exactly. Atom. So they added some grids in the atom, and they made the field that at some point of bring the, the potassium particle away. So they, they actually not only avoided the sucking, but they, they finally got rid of it. But that was a posteriori, it was not foreseen. That's why I say they were lucky, because 